And let's go to the PowerPoint. Come on. There we go. All right. So today we're going to continue uh, going over chapter eight, microbial metabolism. And today we're going to go over aerobic respiration and put that together with glycolysis and fermentation. Okay. So specifically, we're going to go over the learning objectives. We're going to go over aerobic respiration. Um, and then I have an activity for you, okay, where um, I have a table, okay, that's uh, instead of doing quizzes, I'm going to try something a little different. We're going to have you um, fill out a table at home and then uh, get your feedback on it, okay? And then we'll do what I call endosymbiotic theory 2.0. So in other words, we're going to take what we learned about endosymbiotic theory back in chapter four, and we're going to take what we've learned about metabolism and apply it to that. So we're going to take information from two different chapters and put it together, okay? And then we'll go over what's due on Friday and what's coming up. Okay, so this chapter helps us be able to move toward being able to do the following, uh, define the key role of evolution as it applies to microbiology, identify microbial structures and connect the structures to their functions, identify necessary components and processes and microbial metabolic pathways. Okay, we're doing this one big time. And analyze and describe the impact of microorganisms. Okay. All right, so first thing we're going to talk about aerobic respiration. So let's go to the whiteboard. All righty. Okay, aerobic respiration. for the purposes of this class, okay, starts with glycolysis. Okay, we have a glucose come in and it gets split. Okay, that's the lysis part of glycolysis into two pyruvates. And in the process, we make two net ATP. Okay, remember we, uh, we make four total, but we used two back here uh, before we actually split the glucose, okay? And we get two NADH, okay? Now, um, the last time we met, we talked about what happens if you don't have oxygen, okay? Um, if we don't have oxygen, we go from uh, glycolysis into fermentation. We've got to do something with these pyruvate. And we've got to restore our NAD plus to keep glycolysis going. But what we're going to talk about today is going to be if we have oxygen, okay? The aero part of aerobic, okay? So from here, okay, we do have oxygen. Okay. And this is a uh, forest before we dive into the trees view. Okay. So from here, if we have oxygen, okay, we can take this pyruvate and it can go on into the Krebs cycle. Okay. It's also called the citric acid cycle. Okay, and we have an intermediate step before this. Okay. okay, where we prepare the pyruvate to go into the Krebs cycle. Okay, and the Krebs cycle is a cycle. Okay, and we get one turn of the cycle per pyruvate. Okay. So per glucose, we get two turns of the Krebs cycle, okay? 
and from two turns, okay, per glucose, we get two ATP, we get six NAD, NADH, okay, and two of a cousin of NADH called FADH2, okay, we've got these two high energy electron carriers, they carry hydrogens, okay, and we get two ATPs, okay, so per pyruvate, we get one ATP, three NADH, and two FADH2, or one FADH2, okay. Now, in the process, in this intermediate, oh, and I forgot the intermediate step. Let's go back to the intermediate step because we get some energy from that. Per pyruvate, we get an NADH. Okay. So per glucose, we get two of them. Okay. Now on the intermediate step, okay, we lose some CO2, okay? And I'll show you how that happens, but this is, why as humans, we need to exhale and getting rid of CO2 that's coming from aerobic respiration, okay? And when we're talking about microbes, they get rid of the CO2 as well, okay? It's just they don't have lungs. It just diffuses out of the cells and into the surrounding medium, okay? Now on the Krebs cycle, we're going to lose two CO2s. Okay, so for pyruvate, just as a reminder, each of these have three carbons, okay? With glucose, we started out with six carbons, okay? So per two turns of the Krebs cycle, if we include the intermediate step as a part of the Krebs cycle, we lose six carbon dioxides, okay? So basically going from glucose to the Krebs cycle, okay? We take this glucose and we chop it up into CO2. And that's as far as we can go, okay? We can't take this CO2 and get any more energy out of it, okay? Instead, we rely on photoautotrophs to take the CO2, okay? In the process of photosynthesis, okay? Uh, to make sugars out of it, okay? And the sugars go back to glycolysis and we start all over, okay? All right, ATPs, okay? We can use for anything right off, okay? But these NADHs and the FADH2s, uh, we can get some more energy out of them, okay? To make more ATP. So what we do is we take these, and I need to move this. Okay, and they come over here too, and this one comes over here. And we send them to the electron transport chain, okay? And what happens is these NADHs donate hydrogens, okay, and the FADH2s also donate, okay, so NADH, okay, and FADH2 donate hydrogens, okay, and they become less energetic, NAD plus, and FAD, okay, FAD, and they go back to um, NAD plus, can go back to the intermediate step, glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, FAD goes back to the Krebs cycle, okay, and these hydrogens get passed from complex to complex, so it's kind of like a slinky going down the stairs, okay, so we get energy from this hydrogen, okay, and we use that hydrogen to take ADP plus inorganic phosphate, and we crimp those together to make more ATP, okay? So that's kind of a overview, a forest 
before you, we dive into the individual trees, okay? Any questions? Other than I've just bludgeoned you with a bunch of information. Okay, if you think of any questions or if I didn't give you enough time to get to your mute button, let me know, I'm happy to answer them. Okay, so let's talk about the intermediate step. Oh, I'm not giving myself enough room. Let's move that over. Okay. So, pyruvate. Okay coming from glycolysis. And I'm gonna go ahead and draw the structural formula. You don't have to remember this part, but it helps me explain what's going on. Okay, so here's pyruvate, okay? So what happens in the intermediate step, okay? We have an enzyme, there's always an enzyme that comes along and snips off this acid group, okay? And when it does that, it takes this part, okay? And it attaches it to a cofactor, okay? Cofactor A. And so we call this two carbon group that has a double bonded oxygen here, we call that an acetyl group, okay? And this acetyl group gets attached to cofactor A, okay? And that gives us acetyl-CoA. Okay, acetyl-coenzyme A. All right, so um, then, okay, so uh, for the intermediate step, okay, pyruvate is the substrate. Okay, so it was the product of glycolysis. Now it's the substrate for the intermediate step, okay? And acetyl-CoA is a product, okay? And this CO2 that comes off, okay, is also a product, okay? Now this hydrogen, when CO2 comes off, it is carbon double bonded to two oxygens. This hydrogen has energy, okay? We don't wanna waste that. You know, energy is hard to come by. So what we do is we take an NAD plus, and this NAD plus is gonna pick up this hydrogen, okay? And it's going to become NADH, okay? Now, we don't normally consider NADH to be a product because it is an energy carrying molecule. Okay, so it's kind of like an enzyme in that it gets reused, okay? So this will go off to the electron transport chain or glide or um, uh, some other use, and it'll come back as NAD plus, okay, so it cycles around, okay. So that is the intermediate step, okay. So we generate some NADH. That's energy that we can use to make um, ATP, okay. And per pyruvate, we make one. But when we're doing the counting up of this, okay, we always say per glucose, and we get two pyruvate per glucose, so we get two NADH, okay? So let's go ahead and slap some twos on here. We get uh, two pyruvates from glycolysis, okay? And so I'm going to generate two CO2s, and I'm going to generate two acetyl-CoAs, okay, per glucose. How are we doing? Okay. 
Any questions yet? Okay, let's go into the Krebs cycle. Okay, so remember the Krebs cycle is the cycle. Okay, so whatever we start out with here, we go through, we make a bunch of changes, we generate a bunch of energy, and then we end up at our starting spot. Okay, so we have acetyl CoA. Oops, I made my O too big in my CoA. Okay that comes from the intermediate step, okay? And per glucose, I get two acetyl-CoA, but they're gonna go into the Krebs cycle individually, okay? So per, um, per glucose, we get two turns, okay? All right, so acetyl-CoA comes in and it attaches to the first intermediate with which is oxaloacetate. You don't have to remember that, but it comes in and attaches it, this acetyl group, okay, to oxaloacetate, okay. CoA comes off and goes off to, to go work with another pyruvate, okay, to pick up another acetyl group, okay, and we get citric acid. Okay, so that's also why we also call this the citric acid cycle because the first um, intermediate of the cycle is citric acid, okay? Now, once again, you don't have to remember this molecular structure, but it helps me explain what's going on, okay? So we have, three acid groups on citric acid. One, two, three, and as usual, I have forgotten the middle carbon. Let me put another one on. One, two, three, four, five, there we go. Three, four, five, six, there we go. Okay, so citric acid is this, uh, uh, you know, it's uh, when we uh, talk about uh, citric acid, it's something that we need, okay? It's, uh, you know, a part of our diet, vitamin C, you know, all of that good stuff. That's why we need citric acid, okay? Now, in the process of the citric acid cycle, what's going to happen is we're going to snip off some more acid groups, okay? So these acid groups, okay, are going to come off as CO2, okay? Okay, so that's why um, the, uh, one of the products of the Krebs cycle, okay, is carbon dioxide. Okay, so we get two carbon dioxide per turn of the Krebs cycle, okay? Now, once again, we wanna save these hydrogens. These hydrogens have energy, okay? So when we snip off these CO2s, we have NAD plus come in, and they pick up these hydrogens, okay, so that they don't get lost, so that we can use them to generate energy, okay? So these are two of the NADHs that we make per turn of the Krebs cycle, okay? Now, remember, we're talking two turns per glucose, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and put two here. So 
So, so far per glucose, we've got four NADH, okay? And we've got four CO2 coming off, okay? Now, down here at the bottom of the cycle, we have um, a spot where we can take, and I'm going to simplify this for you. It's actually a GDP that gets turned into GTP, but that's often immediately converted into ATP. So I'm going to show it that way, okay, just to keep things simple. Okay, so we get per two turns, okay, two ADP that come and pick up some phosphate groups. And we get two ATP out of that, okay? Now over here, this is where we introduce our FAD, our FAD, okay? So that's gonna pick up an, a hydrogen, okay? Actually two hydrogens that would have normally been lost, but they have energy, we don't wanna be wasteful, okay? So per two turns of the Krebs cycle, we generate two FADH2s and from two FADs, okay? And then up here, as we're taking our intermediates and we're um, uh, turning it back into oxaloacetate, we have another opportunity to pick up a hydrogen, okay? And we get another NADH, okay? And per two turns, we get two of them, okay? So that is, okay, so the products, okay, of the citric acid cycle are CO2, okay? And the substrates, okay, the beginning substrates, are these acetyl-CoAs, okay? And then the energy carrying molecules that are generated, okay, are NADH. We get six of them, okay? Because I've got one, two, three per turn. So I multiply that by two and I get six. And I get one FADH two per turn. So I take one, multiply it by two, and I get two of these guys, okay? And I get two ATPs, okay? How are we doing so far? Okay, now this is continually happening in your cells even as we speak, as I'm causing intense concentration in your neurons of your brain. We're doing all sorts of this to generate energy to be able to think, okay? Kind of an interesting concept, huh? Okay, any questions before I go on to the electron transport chain? Hey, if you're also thinking, how in the world am I ever going to memorize all of this? How am I going to learn all of this? Because this is brand new. It doesn't make any sense. Teresa is speaking Upper Klingon, and I haven't been to a Star Trek convention. So um, repetition, repetition. The way I learned this, and this was back in the Dark Ages, um, a classmate and I went to uh, the library where they had a study room. and there was a blackboard and we took turns drawing it out from memory, okay? When we got done, you know, my partner would say, oh, you forgot. And I'd say, oh yes, you're right. And I would write it in. And then she would say, oh, you got that wrong and I'd fix it, okay? Then I'd erase the board and it was her turn, okay? So you can do that with paper, with a whiteboard, okay? Um, and eventually you're going to get so that you can put it all down from memory and you're going to have it correct. Okay. It's going to take a few tries. Okay. For me, it was more like 10. Okay. Then what I would suggest is wait a day and without reviewing your notes or taking a look at the textbook, try to do it from memory again. Okay. It's like interval training for your brain. Then when you have it in your brain and you've convinced your brain that you really need to hold on to this long-term, 
it's going to put it in long-term memory and all of a sudden the light's going to go on and you're going to go, oh, I get it. I get it. I get what Teresa is trying to communicate here. Okay. So there is hope. There is hope. Teresa, <clears throat> yes. I think, I know for myself, my concern is that I agree with you. I know that's the process of how we learn and such, but we have such little time between now and the test when we actually need to know it. And that's frightening because we don't have five years to, you know, get this solid and become microbiologists. <laughs> and so right. if you have advice on that, in you know, it's intimidating because we don't have that much time <laughs> and we have to pass the test. <laughs> right, right. Well, and you know what? Um, uh, for the first time that I went through it, yeah, it didn't, it didn't take five years. Um, I, I'll admit we were bad. We did this the weekend before the test. <laughs> so if you guys are planning on taking this next Wednesday, you got a week. <laughs> so it's definitely doable. It's definitely doable. And I, I said five years, not to exaggerate, but there was something on the previous test that you said had taken you five years to learn. And I thought at the time, <laughs> we've got five days. So. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Uh, no, I okay. do say in one of my recorded lectures, it took about three classes of covering aerobic respiration uh, before it actually clicked. And it was because I was studying this two days before the test <laughs> and then promptly forgot it because, oh, I'm never going to use this again. And then it showed up in the next class. So, <laughs> so well, there is hope. Faith, if you have faith, I guess we will too. <laughs> I have faith. I have faith. And then we're also going to have this activity um, that's going to give you some practice, okay, in the putting this all down in what I consider a logical format. It may not make any sense to you. Feel free to modify it so it makes sense to you. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully that's encouraging. Yeah, because I don't want to discourage you to the point where it's like, oh, I can't do this. Let's not even try. We don't want that. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Okay, let's move on to the electron transport chain. Okay, for the electron transport chain, we need a membrane. Okay. Okay, so there's my cartoon of a membrane. But just as a reminder, okay, I'm going to draw in. For the sake of time, just a few cartoons of phospholipids, okay? So as a reminder, okay, these phospholipids that make up the phospholipid bilayer of membranes, okay, in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, we have a charge, okay, we've got a negative charge on these heads, which makes them hydrophilic, okay? They interact with the water, on both sides of the membrane, okay? And um, as far as where this takes place, um, we're gonna go over this in endosymbiotic theory 2.0, okay? Um, but this happens on, if we're talking prokaryotes, uh, we're talking the cell membrane. If we're talking eukaryotes, we're talking about the mitochondria um, and in their inner membrane. Okay, so we've got these negative charges and on the inside, there's no charge. We are hydrophobic on the inside, okay? So water has a hard time getting through, it can, okay? But things that have a charge, okay, like sodium, okay? Sodium is gonna come over here and it's gonna hold hands with these phospholipid heads and they're never gonna make it to the center. Okay, they cannot get past. Okay, let's go ahead and put some sodium here. Okay, so I've got some sodium ions hanging out here. Okay, so the cell takes advantage of that to make basically a hydroelectric dam. Okay, so we have, for the sake of simplicity, just three enzyme complexes, okay, that are embedded in the membrane. 
Okay. And then we have this enzyme called ATP synthase. So this enzyme ATP synthase is going to um, act like a turbine on a dam and it's gonna make ATP, okay? So we have, oh, let's get rid of this sodium. Yep. So we have NADH, okay, that comes from glycolysis from the intermediate step in the Krebs cycle, okay, that comes and donates a hydrogen, okay. Then it becomes um, NAD plus. It can go back to glycolysis, the intermediate step, and the Krebs cycle and pick up another hydrogen. So it's kind of like a UPS truck. Okay, or an Amazon van that's delivering hydrogens. Okay, so this hydrogen is given to this enzyme complex, and this enzyme complex is very mean. It takes that hydrogen and it steals its electron. Okay, so this hydrogen gets split, and this hydrogen gets pumped to the other side. Now it's got a charge, it can't get back. It's just like the sodium. It holds hands with these phosphate lipid by uh, phosphate heads of the phosphate lipid bilayer, so it can't get back. It is on the other side of the dam. Okay. So this electron gets passed to the next enzyme complex. And that causes this enzyme complex, if there's no FAD handy, to pump another hydrogen to the other side. Okay. Now, if there is FAD2, okay, it can donate a couple of hydrogens here. It turns into FAD. It can go back to the Krebs cycle, pick up another couple of hydrogens, okay? And it'll also donate electrons, okay? But this electron gets passed to the third complex and we get more hydrogens passed. Okay, to the other side. Okay, so what happens is, is I don't have a whole lot of hydrogens here, but I get a whole bunch of hydrogens up here. Uh, yes, Michelle. When you say it's it's picking up and doing something with hydrogen, where are those hydrogens coming from? Ah, very good question. Um, they're coming from two places. They're either coming from the NADH. Okay, so this H gets taken off. Right. Or from the FADH2. Okay. Or if there happens to be hydrogens floating around in solution. Okay. So where it's are the, the NADH and the F FADH2 coming from? Ah, so this is coming from here. Let me go ahead and draw that in. So they're coming from glycolysis. And the intermediate step in the Krebs cycle. Okay. So they're getting shipped from these factory lines and they're coming over here. Okay. FA because, oh, go ahead. Because those are happen happening continuously. Exactly. Okay. Yep. And then these guys are coming from the Krebs cycle. And then these guys go back and pick up more hydrogens. Does, um, does it matter when they come out? Are they gonna to go to the first one, then the second one, then the third one? Or are they just gonna go wherever they are in the cycle of needing hydrogen to get rid of it or something? So these guys bounce around and it's really quite random, but I have to admit at the beginning, it flipped my brain inside out to think of this as random. So you can think of them being put on a track or a, a track line and uh, being sent here on purpose. Okay. <laughs> so um, the NADH will only fit here. This is an enzyme. So it, when it bounces into here, only NADH will fit in this first one. FADH, it'll only fit in this one. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. 
And there's stuff in the middle that I've left out, but you guys don't need to know about that stuff at this point, okay? Okay, so this is getting to be a lower pH. Okay, it's getting pretty acidic in here. Whoops, that's not the color I want. And these hydrogens are bouncing around, they're running into each other. They would really get, like to get back here, okay? So what ATP synthase does is it opens up a channel to allow hydrogens to get past this hydrophobic center of the, of the membrane, okay? And what happens is when it does that, it causes this part to spin. It looks just like a little turbine, okay? That we use to generate electricity. But in this case, we are generating energy to take ADP, okay, adenine diphosphate. It's got two phosphates, but we want to add another one. So when ATP has a phosphate clipped off, these phosphates just kind of float around. And when this turbine turns, it crimps it just like a, just like a pair of pliers. And it crimps that phosphate onto the ADP and I get an ATP, okay? So in our accounting, one NADH, Okay, because it donates a hydrogen here. And in the process of that electron from the hydrogen getting passed to different complexes, I can use that to pump enough hydrogens to make three ATP. Okay. FADH, because it donates further down the chain, one FADH2 is equal to about two ATP. Okay, so the way I remember this is NADH2, 2 ATP. And then you just have to remember NADH3, you got three. Okay, so we're going to add up things later on. Okay, but first we have to talk about this, fine, this electron. Okay, if this electron stays here, if it does not get passed to another molecule, it's going to stop the chain. Okay because these guys can only hold on to one electron at a time, okay? So this one can't pick up another electron from NADH until this guy hands off this worn out electron, okay? It's at the bottom of the stairs, it's used up as much energy as it can, okay? So we have what is called a terminal electron acceptor. It's the end of the chain, they pick up the electron and then they go off and do their thing, okay? In aerobic respiration, the terminal electron acceptor is oxygen, okay? It comes, it picks up that worn out electron, okay? And becomes water, okay? Actually, it picks up two, that attracts um, some uh, hydrogen, okay? So you notice this isn't balanced and I'm not going to, okay? But oxygen becomes water, okay? That's why we have to breathe in to keep this electron chain going, okay? I've got to breathe in oxygen because the oxygen gets turned into water, okay? Which turns into sweat and all sorts of other things, okay? So oxygen, aerobic respiration, we use oxygen to pick up this worn out electron so that I can keep my electron transport chain going, okay? Now in anaerobic respiration, there are obligate anaerobes, okay? Or facultative, an, um, uh, facultative anaerobes, okay? That have electron transport chains, but they use something other than oxygen, okay? So my favorite one is uh, there are some obligate anaerobes, okay? Uh, we call them, oh, I'm trying to remember whether they're green or purple sulfur bacteria. Anyway, they are sulfur bacteria and they pick up inorganic or uh, sulfur, okay? Sulfur deposits. And they pick up this last electron, two of them, and they turn into 
hydrogen sulfide, rotten egg gas. So if you're walking by a stagnant pond and you look down into the shallow water and you see bubbles coming up and it smells like rotten egg gas, you've got some of these sulfur bacteria that are doing anaerobic respiration. Isn't that cool? And they're bubbling out this nasty smelling hydrogen sulfide, rotten egg gas. Okay, how are we doing? Okay, let's do some accounting. So from glycolysis, okay, per glucose, I have two NADH. How many ATP is that gonna give me when I run it, these NADHs through the electron transport chain? Two times three is six. Six. Okay, so we get six ATP. Okay, from the intermediate step. Okay, per glucose, I get two NADH. Okay, how many ATP is that going to give me? Two times six. three is. Six. Six. Okay, and then from the Krebs cycle, I'm running out of room here. We're just gonna have to draw over the top here. I have six NADH and I have two FADH2s, okay? How many ATPs am I gonna get? 13. Almost. 14. And it's 18. And then how many FADH2s? Or uh, there, uh, the FADH2s are gonna give me how many ATPs? Oh, because it's two cycles. It's two, yeah, two times two is? Got it, so four. Very good, yes. So when we add these up and add in the ATPs we made directly, okay? we get 38 ATPs, okay? So, but that's just for prokaryotes. So for prokaryotes, we get 38 ATPs from aerobic respirations. With eukaryotes, because we've got to move pyruvate into the mitochondria, uh, we have to spend some energy. So we only get 36, okay? But, when you take this into account compared to glycolysis where you get two ATP, this is why facultative anaerobes grow more quickly in oxygen is because they're getting more ATP. They've got more energy to do stuff. Cool, right? Now we humans, we can't run without an electron transport chain for very long. Okay, it's about three minutes and your brain cells start dying. Okay. Um, we can't cut back to two. <laughs> but facultative anaerobes, okay, are able to do that. They can cut back, they can scale back their budget and do okay. All right. Let us go on to the activity, which um, yeah, I haven't given you very much time to do it, but I'm gonna give you a couple of minutes, which yes, is not very long, but go ahead and see if you can fill in this table, okay? So I'll get you started. For, gl for glycolysis, okay, how, what substrates do we get? This is kind of a, wait, it's in the header. That can't be right. Yeah, we have one glucose to start out with, with glycolysis, okay? So the substrate would be glucose. And then the products per glucose, 
okay, are two pyruvate, okay? All right, see if you can fill in the rest of this. We're gonna give you a couple of minutes. And if you don't get done, that's fine. Okay, that's two minutes. I'm sure you didn't finish, but um, this is a good study technique, taking a blank table like this and trying to fill it out as fast as you can from memory, and then, uh, then uh, go back and check to see if you got it right. Okay, fill in what you missed, change what you got wrong, okay? So I'm gonna go ahead and give you the answers, and I have a second a table that we're going to work on, which talks about energy products and, and where things happen in the cell. Okay, so I'm going to pull up the answers. Okay, so substrate for glycolysis, one glucose. Okay, products, two pyruvate. <clears throat> okay, the substrates per glucose for the formation of acetyl CoA, this intermediate step. Okay, two pyruvate. Okay, so these two pyruvate, which were the products of one metabolic pathway, become the substrates of the next one. Okay. So we get two acetyl CoA and two carbon dioxide, two CO2s. Okay. So then the substrate per glucose for the Krebs cycle is two acetyl CoAs. Okay. So these two acetyl CoAs come down and become the substrates for the next metabolic pathway. Okay. These CO2, they don't have any more energy for that we can use. They go off, plants use it to make sugar, okay? All right, so the products of the Krebs cycle, okay, are four CO2, okay, per glucose. So they're gonna go off, they're gonna go to the plants, okay? All right, so the substrates per glucose, okay, are oxygen, hydrogen ions, okay, and why do I have worn out electrons? That goes over here in the products. I'm going to have to fix that. Ignore that one. See, this is where I typed this in and I'm realizing I made a mistake. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to fix this and I'm going to move worn out electrons over here to, uh, to, glucose, uh, to uh, products for glucose, okay? But we have oxygen and hydrogen ions as, su as substrates. And then we get uh, water as uh, the... As final product, okay? <clears throat> okay, so that's aerobic respiration. Now, if we don't have oxygen, okay, I can't do formation of acetyl-CoA. I can't do the Krebs cycle. I can't do the electron transport chain. By the way, I'm lying too, but we're going to keep it simple for this class. Okay, so if I don't have any oxygen, I'm going to go from glycolysis down to fermentation, okay? So in this case, this product becomes the substrate of this pathway, okay? 
and the products for yeast are 2 ethanol and 2 CO2 per glucose, okay? And then for lactic acid producing bacteria, you get 2 lactic acid. And then I have et cetera, et cetera here because not all microbes have the same fermentation products, okay? They make all sorts of stuff that we can make use of, okay? All right, questions. All right, let me know if I'm going too fast. We've got about 15 minutes left. Oh, and then the CO2 leaves. And we make use of this. All right, so I'm gonna fast forward through this. Yeah, okay, because we didn't get to where it happens, okay? But let's talk about where all of this happens and then we'll go back to that other table, okay? So I've got a nice eukaryotic cell here. Um, let me back up. Okay, we're gonna talk about how we got mitochondria, okay? So here's a eukaryotic cell back in the eons of time. It has a nucleus, but it is anaerobic. It is an obligate anaerobe. It doesn't have mitochondria yet, okay? And here's a nice little aerobic bacterium that's swimming around with the flagellum and it gets eaten by the eukaryotic organism, okay? The eukaryotic cell. So it undergoes phagocytosis, okay? So I am engulfed into a vacuole, but somehow it survives, okay? It doesn't get eaten and it loses its peptidoglycan cell wall because living inside of a cell, it doesn't need it, okay? So it becomes mitochondria, okay? We've got an outer membrane that's kind of smooth. And then we have an inner membrane that's all jaggedy and folded like the cell membrane of this aerobic bacterium. Okay, that is the theory of endosymbiosis. And we base this on the fact that mitochondria have 70S ribosomes and they have some circular DNA. Okay, it's not nearly as big as the one that we find in free living bacteria, but they don't need as many because its buddy is taking care of it. Okay, all right, now let's add in where these metabolic pathways happen. Okay, let's start with glycolysis. Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm of prokaryotic cells, okay? It happens in the cytoplasm of eukaryotic cells, okay? So that's fairly straightforward. Glycolysis happens in the cytoplasm. It doesn't matter whether it's eukaryotic or prokaryotic, okay? Then with fermentation, okay? So in our muscle cells, in yeast, Okay, in lactic acid producing bacteria, fermentation happens in the cytoplasm. Okay, so those pyruvates that are formed, they hang out here if there's no oxygen, okay, and they become uh, fermentation products. Okay, like we're talking yeast, CO2, and ethanol, we're talking lactic acid bacteria, lactic acid. Okay. All right, let's move on to the um, aerobic respiration. So we've undergone glycolysis, we've made some pyruvate, there's oxygen. We're gonna go on to acetyl-CoA formation, that intermediate step, okay? That happens in the cytoplasm of aerobic bacteria and uh, facultative anaerobic bacteria. In eukaryotic cells, it happens in the matrix of the mitochondria. It's basically the cytoplasm of that ancient free living bacterium. Cool, right? So this is where we have to take pyruvate and we've got to move it inside here. And you have to spend some energy to do that. So that's why eukaryotic cells get a little bit less ATP than free living prokaryotic cells. Okay. And then the Krebs cycle, okay, happens in the cytoplasm of prokaryotic cells. It happens in the matrix or the cytoplasm of mitochondria, okay? The electron transport chain, we need a membrane, okay? Remember, we're pumping hydrogens to the other side of a membrane, so we've got to have a membrane, okay? In free-living aerobic and facultative anaerobic bacteria. It happens in the plasma membrane, in this cell membrane. Okay, 
in eukaryotic cells. It happens in this inner membrane of the mitochondria, okay? What used to be their cell membrane. Okay, cool, right? Okay, questions about where stuff happens and why we care. Okay, we've got a few minutes. You know what? I'm going to stop the slideshow so that I can back this up to this table and start the slideshow again. Whoop, whoop, go back one. Oh, I went back one too far. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to do this table. Okay, so for here, I'm looking for energy carrying molecules that are used or produced per glucose. So we're talking ATP, we're talking ADP, we're talking NADH plus, NADH and NAD plus, okay, FAD and FAD plus, okay, so we'll give you two minutes. Okay, hey, that's two minutes. I'm sure you're not done. But for the sake of time, let's go ahead and move on. And by the way, um, I'm doing this versus me drawing it out because those are two different ways to study based on what your um, learning preferences are, okay? If you're more of a, we call it logical mathematical, okay? You prefer tables like this, okay, where you've got the different headers, we lay it all out without the messiness of a drawing, okay? If you're more of a visual kinetic person, you prefer to draw it out, like I did when I was explaining the different metabolic pathways that go into aerobic respiration, okay? Depending upon what you prefer, you can do either or. Either one works, okay? Either one is going to give you the information, <clears throat> is going to help you learn the information you're going to need for the test, okay? All right, let's go to the answers of this, uh, this table, okay? So in glycolysis, okay, we use two ATP and we produce two, okay? Uh, we produce two NADH and we don't produce any FADH, okay? Both eukaryote, prokaryote happens in the cytoplasm, okay? ATP, formation of acetyl-CoA, that intermediate step, okay? No ATP, we do get two um, NADH, no FADH2s, okay? Eukaryotes, mitochondria, prokaryotes, it happens in the matrix, I should have put that up there, 
Okay, Krebs cycle, I get two ATP, six NADH, two FADH, okay? This happens in the matrix of the mitochondria, okay? It happens in the cytoplasm of the prokaryote, okay? Here for the electron transport chain in prokaryotes, we get 34 ATP, okay? We get 32 in eukaryotes, okay? And then I have the math here, you get three per NADH, two per FADH2. Um, NADH, we get 10 consumed from glycolysis, acetyl-CoA formation in the Krebs cycle. FADH2, two consumed, okay? They donated their hydrogens, okay? This happens in the cristae, the folds of the inner membrane of mitochondria, prokaryotes, that happens in the cytoplasmic membrane. Okay, jumping down to fermentation, no ATP produced directly, okay? Two NADH consumed because we need NAD plus to keep glycolysis going. No FADH, both happens in the cytoplasm. Okay, how are we doing? Any questions? Okay, just to remind you, the ATP that's produced in glycolysis and in the Krebs cycle can go off and be used immediately, okay? The NADH and FADH, or the NADH produced in glycolysis, the NADH produced in the intermediate step, and the NADH and FADH2 that's produced in the Krebs cycle, go to the electron transport chain where we use it to pump hydrogens to the other side of a membrane so that that ATP synthase can let the hydrogens in and we can make some ATP, okay? Okay, so just remember NADH, we get approximately three ATP, okay? And per FADH2, we get two ATP. So two NADH or FADH, uh, two, two, we get two ATP. Okay, and then here I go ahead and add up how many ATPs we can get from the NADH here and here and here, and then uh, also the FADHs, okay? Here, these FA, uh, NADH is being consumed, so it can go back to glycolysis. Uh, yes, uh, Sherry. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, no uh, worries. So 18 plus 4. <coughs> oh, that, that should be 22. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I've got some mistakes oh, in got... here. I've got <laughs> six. <laughs> Sometimes my addition, I have to uh, double check it with uh, my calculator. <laughs> I can understand that. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. I'm going to fix that. Okay. And then, yes, this NADH goes back down to fermentation. Okay. So we've got a cycle going here. All right. Let's uh, zip through this real quick. Going through on fast forward. Okay, uh, we have about five minutes left, which is enough time to, well, we've got three minutes left, which is about enough time to go over um, what's due, okay? So case study number three is due this Friday, okay? And it's the last one before we do the signature assignment case study, okay? So case studies one through three are practice for the, signature assignment, which is worth more points, okay? Um, exam three opens this Friday, and it will be open until April 6th, which is a week from Saturday, okay? And then for next week, we're going to cover um, two chapters, chapter nine and chapter 10, because one, they're shorter chapters, two, they're closely related, and three, this is not gonna be brand, brand new information. This is gonna be stuff that you've heard of before. It's not gonna be so intimidating. I promise so you're gonna be going, oh, this is why I wanted to take microbiology. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> 
So uh, the first time we meet, we will cover chapter nine. The second time we meet, we'll cover chapter 10. Okay, and they're, they're lovely interrelated. And I hate to say it, but we've been living it for the past two years. Oh, I'm so glad that the new strains of COVID are looking pretty benign. Huh. And we will talk about that process next week. <laughs> Okay, any questions? Okay, let's call it good. <laughs>